Hi there, this is Don McGlynn. I'm the producer and director of Ed Thigpen, Master of Time, Rhythm, and Taste. And what you're going to be hearing in today's podcast, which is taken from my documentary, is um, my sort of summary of Ed's career. Uh, it sort of tells you what, what he was doing prior to us making this film. And followed by that, uh, you're going to hear a song called Like Blues, which is by Ed. Uh, it's a, you're going to hear the whole number. And it is sort of a fascinating blend of Western Europe meeting America. Because on drums you have Ed Thigpen, of course. And on piano you have Horace Parlin, who is one of my favorite pianists. He was living in Copenhagen also, and he had a great and illustrious career with people like Dexter Gordon and uh, Charles Mingus. And he had settled in America in the 1970s. And then you'll be hearing three musicians from Scandinavia. Two of them were from Denmark, Jens Winter on trumpet and Jesper Bodelsen on bass. And Thomas Frank is also on this uh, performance, on this recording. Uh, he's from Sweden. And directly after that, though, we're going to uh, sort of overhear a little trip uh, Ed and I had to go to a photo shoot. It was a photo shoot for a record that Horace and, and Ed had just made. And they're sort of exchanging ideas. The first people you'll be hearing from, though, apart from Ed and me, is this photographer, Nicola, from Italy. Then you're also going to hear Soren Friss, who's from the uh, record label that was putting out the, uh, this record with Ed and, uh, and Horace. Then you're going to be hearing from Horace. And there's a nice sort of like miniature history, jazz history, about jazz piano. And you'll be hearing about Ed's whole concept of what, about what the African-American experience was. You'll also be hearing from Billy Taylor, that, that great pianist who was such a great, uh, not only a great pianist, um, and he worked with Ed many years ago, but he was a great educator. He was on television a lot talking about it. Um, anyway, that will be the end of the second podcast about Ed Thigpen, and I hope you enjoy it. I decided to follow Ed as he got ready for one of his gigs. Hi, Donald. Good morning. Don't take any pictures up in this funky room. Ooh. Are you kidding? That's what we're here for. Oh, man. <laughs> it's a storage room. Just hold that for a minute, Don. Yeah. Don, I'll put you to work. Sure. What should I carry? One of these. Yeah, that's easy. Yeah, I've been up here, my gosh, 17, 16 years? Really? It's soundproof up here, though. Mm. Can't hear it at night. Let's get this here, downstairs. Here. Okay. That's heavy. Come on, Sugar. Watch it. Enduro. Whatever I do, if I'm carrying drums and stuff, a roadie will have to be included in the budget because I can't uh, handle this stuff like I used to. Take four cases and have everything there. At this age, you're still doing it, right? You sure you got that okay? <laughs> I'll take it if you want. But I'm going to need you to take it. Sure. Some of it. Yeah. Let me do it now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Huh? It looks like a lot of work, and you do this every gig. It's more work now than it used to be when I started up. Because you have so many gadgets and attachments. It was very simple. I used to break down a set in four minutes, four and a half minutes, five minutes. I could put it up in 15 max. The equipment is heavier. There are more screws, you know. This goes somewhere. <laughs> I'll put it in my pocket because it'll show up. I just, as long as I can see the piano. Yeah. Well, thank you. Ed likes to talk about what he calls his spiritual family which extends to a lot of the musicians that he plays with. They respect him a great deal for his musicianship, 
but they're also very close to him personally. He's a very deep person. We talk a lot about life when we're on tour, and it's always a really big experience to be around him. Ed is, is one of those people who really uh, feels things deeply and uh, expresses uh, that feeling uh, in his, his music. And when he performs, he puts a stamp on music, which is very uh, uh, distinctive. He's a saint, but he knows the talk of the devil, but he's a saint. And he knows how to keep the devil away. And he knows how to use the devil when it's needed on the stage. But he can keep it away in his life, and I really envy that. I think he's a, he's a, he's a beautiful person. I think that um, it is one of the most fantastic drummers in, in the jazz history. He's been playing so much music for decades, you know. Ed Thigpen has uh, always captured uh, people's ears and their imagination when he performed. Uh, it was true when he worked with me, it was true when he worked with Oscar Peterson, it was true when he worked with Dinah Washington. I mean, that's, that's been something that, that is uh, uh, a constant in his work. If you're going to write a, a history of jazz drums, for example, Big Fan's got to be there. This man has uh, marshaled all of these talents uh, in a way that can be understood by students, can be understood uh, by his co-ed workers, uh, can be understood by the man in the street. And uh, there are very few people you can say that about. Ed and I talked about where we should photograph the music numbers for this documentary, and we both agreed that we wanted to avoid the usual jazz cellar. So we decided to shoot outside in the courtyard at the Kong Arthur Hotel, which is a very jazz-friendly place. Now there's Ed, and I'm just a little bit over here to the right, talking to him about how we should place the instruments. <laughs> Uh, we'll be able to see it fine. From up there, it's perfect, isn't it? Bass is going to sit. We've got to do something about this. Uh -huh. We're not going to adjust over here. Bass there. And the horns, very important. Yeah. So, be horns in front. so I can pull this one way or the other. But that's cool. That's cool. Okay. I keep being reminded of, you know, just the sheer amount of work Ed has to do before each gig. It's just uh, sort of mind-boggling. And here, he, you know, he's been doing this for over, you know, five decades. The first thing that people think about when they think of Ed is his long associations with Oscar Peterson and then later on with Ella Fitzgerald. These were really great associations for him. But, you know, he's been on something like 900-plus records, and he's played with absolutely hundreds of other musicians. As a matter of fact, he's always been known as sort of the ultimate sideman. But before his association with Oscar Peterson, he played with a whole lot of other people like um, Cootie Williams and Dinah Washington, Johnny Hodges, Bud Powell, and Billy Taylor. And of course, when he moved to Denmark, he had very long associations with people like Thad Jones, Horace Parlin, Kenny Drew, and Ernie Wilkins. And when a great musician would be touring through Europe and didn't have their own band, when they came to Denmark, they knew that they could always rely on Ed because he could always be the centerpiece of a great rhythm section. So I was very eager to make it clear to people that Ed was just much more than a sideman. He's had such an interesting life, very unusual from other musicians at the time. And it's fascinating to me that late in his career, he's decided to create new challenges for himself as a composer, and also as a leader. And rather than see him backing a lot of people in a bunch of old clips, we're gonna see him leading his own bands. Okay. Yeah.
Ed had recently made a record with another American musician named Horace Parlin, who was also living in Denmark, and they needed to make a photo for the cover. So I thought I'd come along because I knew Horace quite well. I'd made a movie about him and take a few shots. The only problem is, and it was completely my fault, we got on the wrong bus and Ed started getting nervous about being late. Good, but we should have just taken a taxi from the start. That's what I said. Yeah. Don't let listen to you. <laughs> we'll be there, don't worry. We've still got about eight minutes, seven minutes. Okay. I don't want to be late. You know how it is when you're late. You get nervous. You can't, you can't perform. I'm still performing for this gentleman up here. <laughs> I'm nervous already. Of course, it made sense that a man who spent decades keeping time always wanted to be on time. That's good day. Thank you. Thank you. Well, to do it in one of these folds there, I think, because oh, yeah. they, they are not uh, riding you know, down there. But we can move the furniture, we can take whatever we want. Is the other you furniture know? upstairs? The yes, there's more furniture. Oh, okay. oh, really busy, really. That's good. Ah, a lot good. of business and no, no money. <laughs> <laughs> Cash receivable. Uh, well, accounts receivable. <laughs> yeah, accounts receivable. Okay. okay. Where's the gig? Oh, so we can Where's the gig? <laughs> I have a history teacher at the university, and that was the one thing he said that I remember was that the one thing that you learn uh, about history is that you never learn anything. Because <laughs> <laughs> people keep making the same Save mistakes, dumb mistakes all, all the time. time. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. Ed's an educator and a musician, and he spent an awful lot of time thinking about jazz history. The term jazz is just, the word itself uh, is too small to encompass all that's involved in the music. But the African American uh, experience brings into play, I would say, the West African or the African tradition. Slaves that were brought to the United States were separated. So they didn't have their tribal cultures uh, continuing. You had the gospel influence, the field hollers, the early development of the cakewalk and the slaves dancing. Certain peoples became more musically educated. It becomes more sophisticated. And the guys we I heard, not in person a lot, but listening to was turned on to the winning line Smith. That's one. Oh. People, see, he was such an entertainer, I think people mis misunderstand. I heard a piano piece one time. I was sitting there, I said, God damn. It was past, like, when you say Art Tatum, right? But it has something else. I said, I said, what? And somebody said, that's Fats Waller. There was a sophisticated music. It was, there were many things about it which were admirable. And, uh, 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 I had reached a place where I could say jazz is America's classical music. It became kind of a hybrid. Jazz is a hybrid. It's an admixture of many cultures. We all had respect for, uh, uh, the respect that Ed had for Joe Jones and, and for uh, people who preceded himself. Uh, uh, came from his father and from, from all the musicians that he knew. I wouldn't dream that I'd be saying things that my mentor said, let's say repeating that listening to the older guys when I was younger. Mm. Talk. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm older. And I say the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The same yeah, yeah. things they were saying. <laughs> the more they were saying, the more they stayed the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You ready to go? Hey Boppers, Keon here, and you've just finished the second episode in our series on Ed Thigpen. We hope you enjoy this day in the life of Ed, and you'll join us in two weeks for the third part. These episodes are drawn from the film Ed Thigpen, Master of Time, Rhythm, and Taste, directed by Don McLean, edited by Frank Axelson and Christian Mulkey with, with sound by Thomas Martin. Bop is produced by Don McLean, co-produced by Mark Canner and Franny Alfano, and edited by me, Keon Baziri. Until next time, thanks. <laughs>